Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And officially, welcome to the debates. You found out today that you have qualified for the debates. Yes, yes, we're excited about it. Yeah. That is, uh... Is that, is that a weight off your shoulders? Because there's so many candidates right now that it really is, like, who's gonna be at the debates, and now you're gonna be there. Yeah, a little bit. Most people would have never given me a chance to get on the debate stage, and here we are, and that's kind of the beginning of the game, and just, we're in the game, and we're excited to get our message out. Right, do you really believe that you have a shot in this game? Mm -hmm. Just because you are one of the candidates who's living in that world where in some places you're polling between zero and two percent, right? And I know you don't believe you're out of it, but why? where I come from, I represent the forgotten communities of the country. And I think you look at the history of these races, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, uh, Donald Trump. Right. I mean, the, the winner comes out of, usually comes out of nowhere. And I think when people hear that I come from a forgotten community, I've represented these forgotten people who have lost jobs the last 30 or 40 years, and go back to steel mills closing outside of Youngstown, Ohio, mm -hmm. in the late 1970s. My father-in-law was one of them. I could tell you a story 15 years ago about my cousin Donnie, he was a Vietnam vet. His last act at his factory was to unbolt the machine from the factory floor, put it in a box, and ship it to China. And I could tell you a story a couple weeks ago, the General Motors factory that used to have 16,000 people is now idle. So when people hear that I know what they're going through, yes. I understand it, that's what we need in the White House. And I make one promise to them, Trevor. All I say is, all I know and all I can promise you is when I'm in that White House, when I walk into that Oval Office every morning, I won't forget who you are and I'll know exactly what to do on your behalf. It's and I think when that message gets out, we're gonna move. You, 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 you talk about those people who are in your district, and, and it, what really is fascinating about those votes is, is many of them voted for Barack Obama. Yeah. And then they switched over to Donald Trump. Who promised that their jobs would come back? Right. But as you said, the yeah. plants are still closing. Yeah. But we're reading that many of them still support Donald Trump. So how would you sway that type of voter who seems to still be with him even though his promises have fallen apart. You know, I think those articles are overstated. I think the shine's coming off the apple. People are saying you made all these promises and you hadn't delivered. Mm -hmm. And so my argument to the Democratic uh, voter is to say, look, who better to prosecute the case on the economy than the very person who represents the communities that Donald Trump lied to? about bringing the economy back. He hasn't done a damn thing. We're still getting our rear ends kicked by China with electric vehicles, with solar panels, with wind turbines, all these manufacturing jobs that I want to bring back. Yes. He hasn't done anything to do that. So I'm the best person to prosecute that case in, prosecute, sorry, but prosecute that case in Western Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Indiana, those states that we need to win on an economic argument I believe I'm the best person to do that. You, you have been big on economics. That's been your, your, your talking point for a very long time. You've said that Democrats need to talk economics, otherwise they will lose elections. What does that mean when you say that? Well, it means you have to talk to what people are thinking about and what they're feeling. 75% of the American people still live paycheck to paycheck. 40% of the American people can't withstand a $400 emergency, which means you blow your tire out or somebody gets sick, your economic life unravels. And we have to speak directly to that. Now, those are, those are you know, the people I represent every mm -hmm. single day, and that's what they're thinking about. And it's not just my district. It's, you, there's tent cities in Los Angeles. There's people who are in the fishing industry on the coast that are affected by climate and everything else. Right. They're losing their jobs. There's you know, manufacturing people in my area, and they're not white people. They're, it's white, black, brown, gay, straight, urban, rural people in, in uh, rural Iowa. Uh, are getting killed right now. Farmers haven't made a profit in five years, and mm -hmm. they have the highest suicide rate. So everyone's hurting now. It's time for us to come together. I think it's time for us to have a nominee and a president who actually understands what everyone's going through, and it's from a part of the country who's been dealing with this for decades. So do you genuinely believe that the 23 other candidates don't cover these bases? Not, not like I do. Right. I mean, this is where I live. I've lived here 45 years. And as I said, my father-in-law, my cousins, when these factories close, I know who they are. Do you I mean, think that the Democratic Party has, has become a party where some of these people have forgotten how to speak to some of these people who live in, in these areas you're speaking about? To some extent, we've become a very coastal party. We've become a very Ivy League party. And I think we've forgotten in many ways how to talk to the workers. I right. mean, when, when I campaign for my reelection for Congress, it's wages, it's pensions, it's health care, it's mental health, 
It's education, affordability, making sure you can get your kid into a certificate program or two-year mm -hmm. degree mm -hmm. or college. Bread and butter issues. That's how you beat Donald Trump, because he hasn't delivered for them. Let's talk about education. One thing that I've, I've, I've really been intrigued by is how you've talked about being 100% for education, but reshaping the way education is spoken about in America. You're not a big fan of everyone being pushed towards college or nothing. Right. What does that mean and why is that important to you? Well, most of the jobs in the future, you talk about building an economy where we're making things again, electric vehicles, solar, wind, all these other things. Yes. Uh, technology. Those, most of those require a two-year degree. Most of them require a certification. So how do we start that a little earlier with vocational training in our high schools, start getting kids on a track, mm -hmm. and then getting them that certification, getting them that two-year degree, because that's where 70% of the people are gonna go. Yeah, we need, college needs to be, I think, free. I think, you know, we, it used to be K through 12. Yes. For the old economy, that's free. Everyone pays taxes, every kid can go. The economy has shifted dramatically, so K through 12 is just not going to cut it anymore. So we need to expand it. But let's focus on these technical degrees. Let's have an industrial policy and create that pipeline so these workers from high school certification can then fill those jobs. That's how you begin to build the economy. And when it comes to K through 12, we've got to reform it in the sense that the first thing we have to do is deal with the kids' trauma. Most of the kids, my wife's a first grade teacher, uh, most of the kids that come in are in some kind of trauma. They have adverse childhood experiences that we never deal with. Right. And I want to push a social and emotional learning curriculum in every school in the United States, a trauma-based curriculum. I want a mental health counselor in every school in the United States. Wow. So we start dealing with the root causes of our kids' inability to learn. We know what the brain science tells us is that when you're in trauma, when you're in fight or flight mode, you literally can't access the part of your, your brain you need to learn. Yes. So I don't care what your plans are. I mean, I, my wife's a teacher. I want her to make more. We should pay teachers more. But if you're not dealing with climate of the classroom and the trauma and adverse childhood experiences, you're not going to get the kid ready to learn. You've got all the policies. The, the big challenge now for you is going to be getting noticed with all of the candidates out there. I noticed um, at, uh, at the gathering of the, of the Democrats that happened out in California, everyone chose a walkout, walkout song. You know, Elizabeth Warren had like <laughs> 9 to 5, <laughs> Dolly Parton, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, Bernie Sanders. Hit choice. Everyone had a song that said something about them. Your song when you walked out was uh, Lil Nas X, Old Town Road. Yeah. <laughs> That was a, an interesting... What is, I, I couldn't figure out, what does that mean? Like, what, what, are, what are you saying? I had one target audience there. And that was? My kids. I wanted to look <laughs> old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you got that, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having Looking me. Looking forward to seeing you at the debates. Thank you. Congressman Tim Ryan, everybody.